Family Theater presents Hildegard and John Lund. From Hollywood, the Mutual Network, in cooperation with Family Theater, presents Hostage, starring John Lund. And now, here is your hostess, Hildegard. Thank you, Tony Lafrano. Family Theater's only purpose is to bring to everyone's attention a practice that must become an important part of our lives if we are to win peace for ourselves, peace for our families, and peace for the world. Family Theater urges you to pray. Pray together as a family. And now to our transcribed drama, Hostage, starring John Lund as Bliss. What's the real purpose of your trip? Gentlemen, gentlemen, if there are more to tell, I'd be only too glad to oblige. But the facts are all contained in the joint release issued by this subcommittee. Now, this trip will be nothing more than a goodwill junket behind the Iron Curtain. The first of its kind to Poland, I believe, by Congressman Jordan, Meeker, Congressman Kazimierz, and uh, myself. We're going to compare notes on Polish agricultural methods and practices, we expect to be gone from Washington in a total of two weeks, including flying time. And, uh, well, that's it. I, for one, would like to predict that we won't learn anything about collectivized farming we don't already know. Principally, that it doesn't work. Oh, would you care to enlarge upon that, Congressman? Yes, I would. Arthur, can I have uh, a word with you for a minute? I can't leave now. Well, there's someone here who wants to see you. Come on, this is important. Who is it? That woman I spoke to you about, uh, Mrs. Lubachoff, she's here at the airport. Oh, now, George. Well, Arthur, uh, she's a constituent. She flew all the way to Washington to see you. But I can't do her any good. Well, you can talk to her. I don't want to stir up any international incident. Her son probably isn't even alive. Oh, look, will you just give her a few minutes? It's, it's that gray-haired woman on the bench in front of the lockers. Uh, Mrs. Lubachoff? All right. Mr. Gary. Uh, this is Mr. Arthur Bliss, your congressman. Oh, Mr. Bliss, Mrs. I... Mrs. Lubachoff... I wish I had more time to discuss this matter of your son, but I as you see... I know you are very busy, sir. I only want to give you these, these letters. I'm sure you're aware that the Defense Department has made a thorough inquiry into this these case. These are proof, Mr. Congressman. Letters from Poland proof my young is alive. You can find him there. Mrs. Lubachoff, I'd like to help you. You must know that. Uh, they're going out of the passenger ramp, Arthur. I have to go now. Please, say you will try to find him. But I've only got two weeks. Please, just promise that you will try. He is my only son. All right. All right, Mrs. Lubachoff. I'll try. Congressman Casimirs. Yes, Mrs. Bliss. Wonder if I might talk to you for a moment. Uh, of course. Sit down. I've, uh... I've got a favor to ask you. Yeah? You know much about the Lubachoff case? Is that the missing flyer? Yes, his mother's one of my constituents. Uh, not much. It was all a long time ago, wasn't it? Over six years. October 1950. Well, Lubachoff, his full name is John Vladek Lubachoff, airman second class. Mm -hmm. He was one of a four-man crew making a routine flight in a patrol bomber over the Baltic. The plane was reported missing, later declared lost. No one ever learned what happened to it. Oh, yes, I remember. Well, his mother is convinced that he's still alive, that he was captured and interned in Poland. Up till now, she's been working through the Defense Department. I met her for the first time just before our plane took off tonight. She gave me these, these two letters. She says they prove her son is alive. Do they? I can't tell. They're written in Polish. I'd uh, like you to translate them if you can. Let's have a look. Well, this uh, first is from a man named Rovek, Joseph Rovek. Uh, he seems to be a nephew of Mrs. Lubachoff's. His address is in Warsaw, but 
The envelope has a Swiss postmark, so he must have smuggled it out of Poland to be mailed. January 1951. Uh, I can't make out all the writing. Well, just give me the gist of it. Um, Rovek says he was permitted to visit Airman Lubachov at the Americans' request in an internment camp sometime in December 1950. Uh, he doesn't say where the camp is, but he tells Mrs. Lubachov he thinks he can arrange for John's unofficial release. Unofficial release? What do you suppose that means? Well, most likely that he tried to help him escape. Uh-huh. Well, what else? Well, that's all. He says he'll write again within a few weeks. How about the second letter? Yeah, well, this is a different handwriting entirely, signed by a man named Lutzlo Tachelski. Let's see. Yes, yeah, apparently he's a friend of Rovac. No, 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 wait. Yeah? yeah it seems that um, uh, Rovac, the man who wrote the first letter, was using this man Tachelski's address in Warsaw as a mail drop, a place where he could receive letters from Mrs. Lubachoff in America without calling attention to himself. Yes, I see. Well, um, this letter was written in October 1951, almost a year later. Tuchelsky writes that he hasn't seen Rovek since the early part of that year, that all Mrs. Lubachoff's letters have been piling up at his place in Warsaw, and he has no idea what happened either to Rovek or to her son. He asks her to stop sending mail to his address. Too dangerous. That's the whole letter? Everything. Well, what do you think? Hmm? Well, unless that first letter is a hoax, Lubachev was still alive two months after his plane disappeared. It would seem so. What about the second letter? Well, there's a way you could check on it when we get to Warsaw. Look up Mr. Tuchelsky? Yeah, you've got his address. If he's still there and can produce the letters from Mrs. Lubachoff, he's probably who he says he is. And then what? Well, after that point, Mr. Bliss, I would turn the matter over to the American Embassy. And this is all the mail you've received from her? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Seven letters, all sent to Josef Rovek at my address. Mr. Tuchelski, aren't you taking sort of a risk paying a visit to the hotel room of an American official in broad daylight? I had a reason, also an excuse, Mr. Bliss. My brother works here as a waiter. Oh, I see. Uh, what do you do for a living? I am in a factory. Well, these letters seem to be from Mrs. Lubachoff, Arthur. American postmark. I'd say they're genuine. Hmm. What's your opinion, Mr. Tuchelski? About what? Oh, why do you think Rovek disappeared and never came by to pick up any more of these letters? I do not know. Well, you must have some opinion. He was a good friend of yours, wasn't he? Not close friends. Uh, during the war, we served together in the Polish squadron of the Air AF. But Rovek trusted you enough to confide his plans about helping Lubachov escape. Uh, politically, we were sympathetic. You mean you were anti-communist? Yes. We were thinking of going to the American ambassador here and showing him the letter that Rovek sent to Mrs. Lubachov just after he saw her son in the internment camp. I failed to see what that would accomplish. If our ambassador were to confront your government with that oh, letter... Oh, they would have to deny everything. And where would be your proof? Rovek has disappeared. But you know that he visited Lubachov in the camp. And if you told them that, I would disappear. That is why I took the risk of coming to see you. I, I, I would like to have my letter back, the one which I sent to Mrs. Lubachov. Now, it can be of no further use to you, but if it fell into the wrong hands here in Poland, well, you can imagine. Yes, I guess you've got a point, Mr. Tuchelski. All right, here you are. Oh, thank you very much. You have done me a service. Now, perhaps I can return it. Go ahead. Rovek may be alive somewhere in prison. He may be dead. Your best opportunity of finding out is at the Ministry of Intelligence right here in Warsaw. Uh, Warsaw. Do you honestly believe that they tell us? No, not if you mention the Lubachov matter, no. But if you concoct some simple, credible story, a, a relative in America who is simply curious, perhaps, and if the person of the ministry with whom you speak does not connect Rovek with Erman Lubachov, who knows? Well, 
Well, gentlemen, you have had the grand tour. What do you think of our bureaucratic machinery? Well, it doesn't seem to be much different from our own, Mr. Vronsky. <laughs> well, if you excuse me. Of course. Vronsky? Mm-hmm. So... Well, Mr. Kazmieres, the last information we seem to have on Josef Rovak is that he moved from Lublin in early 1951. I would not want you to repeat this, but it is possible that he defected to the West. Uh, such things have happened. Well, thanks for trying to help us, Mr. Ronsky. Uh, not at all. When I visit the United States, perhaps you can help me look someone up. Perhaps we can. Here, I'll see you out. Oh, that won't be necessary. We've taken up enough of your time already. Then, on behalf of the entire ministry, may I say... Thank you for paying us this visit. It was our pleasure, sir. Goodbye. Yeah, goodbye. Goodbye. Get me Josef Rovek on the line. No, I'll hold on. Hello? Yes. Just a moment, please. It is for you. Who is it? The Ministry. Hello? But I swear I don't know anything about it. Yes. Yes, I understand. What is wrong? Two congressmen from America inquiring about me. Is it... It can't be anything else. They're looking for John Lubachev. Maria, I have to see them, talk to them. But to take such a risk... You must deliver a note to their hotel. Here, sit down. Write what I say. Pretty dark here, huh? No darker, I suppose, than the average graveyard at night. Mr. Bliss? What? Huh? Is that you? Who is it? May I see your identification, please? Both of you. Why are you carrying a gun? Because I may need it. You are Joseph Rovek? This is my wife, Maria. How do you do? How do you do? How do you do? I presume you're looking for me to inquire into the disappearance of John Lubachev. That's right. How did you know how to get in touch with us? You didn't fool the man at the ministry. He knew what you wanted. He phoned me a warning to stay away from you. I see. That's why we're meeting in this out-of-the-way cemetery? And that is not the main reason. Follow me. We turn off the path here. It's just a few rows over. Maria, turn the light on the grave marker. Yes. Can you read the lettering, Mr. Bliss? Jean... Vladek Lubachev, 1920-1951. This is the grave of John Lubachev? Yes. How did it happen? After I went to see him in the internment camp, November 1950, I wrote his mother that I would try to help him escape. It, it took some scheming and bribing, but by February, three months later, the date was set. Then Lubachev did escape? Yes. But in doing so, he was wounded. After under ordinary circumstances, it would not have been serious. A flesh wound in the leg. But it was ten miles to the rendezvous point. He lost a lot of blood. By the time we found him, Maria and I, he was unconscious. He... he never again regained his senses. Twelve hours later, he was dead. And you buried him here? The very next day. I, uh... I took something from... John's body. I planned to send it to his mother. My mail was being watched. Perhaps you can give it to her. His identification tag. John W. Lubachev, 745 Carson Street, Wilson, Pennsylvania. A long way from home. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Rovick. I'm sorry it had to be such bad news. Yes, so are we. But it was very generous of you to risk seeing us. We'll make sure that his mother gets these. Goodbye, sir. Goodbye. Goodbye, Mrs. Rovick. Goodbye. Well, I suppose we might as well be getting back. Just a moment, gentlemen. Tuchelsky. What are you doing here? Listening. 
and watching, I followed from the hotel. Oh, well, that was thoughtful of you. My brother, the waiter there, informed me that you had received a letter from Josef Rovek, delivered by his wife. That's right. That's why we met him here tonight. You did not. Uh, what? I caught a glimpse of this man's face and heard him speak. You're saying this wasn't Joseph Rovek who just left here? I knew Rovek well. This was not he. But, but he knew all about us, what we wanted. And, th and these dog tags. How do you explain those? I cannot, but this man is not Rovek, believe me. Well, then who would he be? Polish counterintelligence, I imagine. Why? Yes, what's the sense in it? If you believed him, it puts an end to the Lubachev business. The man is dead and buried. His own cousin told you. You think that Lubachev is still in the internment camp? If he is alive at all. But why this fake grave and all the other trappings? You said that the government could simply deny they ever captured Lubachev, and that would be the end of it. I forgot the letter, Congressman. The one that the real Rovek sent to Mrs. Lubachev in America. Now, clearly, the government knows of it. The man here tonight mentioned it himself. You think Rovek told him he wrote it? I, I expect he was persuaded to after they discovered his part in the escape plans. Now, the point is, the letter exists. It is evidence. And they are curiously legalistic when it comes to dealing with such things. Now, wait a minute. Then, if the grave is a fake, no record of it could exist. I mean, no genuine record. Hardly. It must have been created very recently. Well, just proving that would give us something to confront the government with, wouldn't it? Mm, it might. Wouldn't getting a look at such records involve a lot of red tape? Not in a church graveyard like this. The burial records are kept by the sexton. Someone here on the premises? That small building to the left of the front gate as you came in. But, but it is forbidden. We won't touch your records. All we want to do is confirm the date of his burial. All right, all right. They are over here. Um, what was his name? Lubachev. Jan Lubachev. Mm -hmm. He was buried in January or February 1951. Um, 53, 52, 51. Now, uh, yes, yes. Here is his card. February 9, 1951. I, I remember that burial. Very small funeral. No requiem mass either. See? Written right there. I do not understand. Well, could... Could you tell us how long this card has been on file? Oh, why, ever since the day of the funeral, six years. That is my handwriting. What do you think? Uh, let me try something. Uh, old man. Yeah? Hmm? You are an official of the church? I am. Will you swear to me on this rosary that that record in the grave out there has existed for the past six years? I swear it. I'm convinced. Well, if, if the grave is genuine, maybe Lubachow was buried there after all. I do not believe it. Why not, Tchelsky? Because if he were, the government would not have needed an imposter to tell you. I'm still not convinced we're doing the right thing. It's all we can do. But suppose Tchelsky is wrong. What if Rovek isn't an imposter? Arthur, in things like this, you have to trust someone. At least we know who Tchelsky is. The man from the British Embassy personally identified him. Oh. Gentlemen, I'm sorry to have kept you waiting. I'll come into my office. I, uh... Hope we're not interrupting anything important. Oh, on the contrary, I'm delighted if my ministry can be a further service to you. Uh, sit down, sit down. Oh, thank you. Ah, how can I assist you? Six years ago, an American airman by the name of John Lubachev was shot down and interned in this country. We have proof of that. Uh, I'm afraid I'm unfamiliar with the case. If that's so, how is it that you reached Joseph Rovek so quickly yesterday after telling us that you had no knowledge of his whereabouts? Oh, as to that... Uh... Mr. Vronsky, let me show you something. These belong to Airman John Lubachev. They were given to us last night by a man who called himself Joseph Rovek. We have reason to believe that he is an imposter, someone employed by your ministry. Well, that being the case, how did he come into possession of those, Lubachev's identification tags? Unless the government is behind this entire matter. 
I suggest that you get in touch with Mr. Robeck and ask him yourself. This is his phone number. Then, then he does work for you? You might say that. Good afternoon, gentlemen. This is where he turned off. Uh, hand me that light, will you, Roman? Arthur, I think we're wasting our time. It's 10.30. Rovex, half an hour late already. Well, he said he'd be here. Why do you want to look at the grave again? Just an idea. I think I've got it. You got what? Why is it Vladek? What? Well, now think about it. Why is it Jan Vladek Lubachev on the grave marker? Because that was his name. Yes, but outside of us, who knows it? Look, it's not on his identification tags, not Vladek, just the initial W. Even so. Well, it's not the most common Polish name in the world. There's Vladislav. Well, there's a lot of them, Martha. Yes, but... Well, then how did Rovek know for sure that Lubachev's middle name was Vladek? Maybe he told him. When? It's not the kind of thing he'd bother to tell a man who'd come to visit him in a prison camp. And even if we believe Rovek's story, by the time he found Lubachev, after his escape, he was unconscious... And he never came to again. Arthur, what are you getting at? Yes, Mr. Bruce. What? Rovek. What are you getting at? You better be careful with that gun. This is one killing the government won't cover up for you. My husband has never killed anyone. Never mind, Maria. You might be surprised, Congressman, at how much the government will do for me. Not anymore, they won't. You'll have to get out of this one yourself. Don't be so sure. You'll understand how sure I am when I tell you it was the undersecretary himself who gave us your phone number. I don't believe... It's true. They're cutting you loose. Airman Lubachev. You... You... You don't know what happened. Well, I can guess. Your captors were persuasive, friendly, and... Not Russians, but people of your own blood who had fought Hitler, just as you had. All right, they made a fool of me, but I could have stopped there. I could have pulled back. If it hadn't been for my cousin, Joseph Rovek. He wanted to help me escape, and they found out about it. The night of the break, they came and told me they knew everything. A government man had gone to meet Rovek in my place and killed him. So now I had a choice. I could rot in prison forever or become what they called a voluntary expatriate. Assuming your cousin's identity. That's right. And you still didn't get it? They said it was for propaganda. I'd been held up when the time came as an example of someone who chose communism. So I said, all right, I'd do it. I thought once I was out of prison, I'd find a way to get clear of the country. So I, I became Joseph Rovek and left the internment camp six years ago. And when did they tell you about the grave? Two or three weeks after I was out. They put it right on the line. If I try to escape, they send the story ahead of me that I betrayed my own cousin for my freedom. And as proof, his body would be found in that grave with my name on the headstone. Did you know that in addition to the letter from Rovek, your mother received another one? No. If you're telling the truth, it could be used to support your story. From whom? A man here in Poland who was a friend of Rovex. Congressman Bliss. Tuchelski. That was a mistake saying my name. You, drop your gun, drop it. What is this? I told you this man was not Rovex, but you had to find out for yourself. He's Lubachev, the missing American. So I heard, and I heard the rest. Well, then put away that gun. You've got nothing to be afraid Mr. of. Mr. Bliss, you know his secret, but you can go back to America in safety. I cannot. What are you talking about? I must stay here in Poland with him and trust that he will not give my name to his friends at the ministry. I, I won't say anything. My good man. I swear it. You will be forced to for your own protection. Your friends will want to learn who it was that told the congressman you were an imposter. I, I say I don't know. And they will know you are lying. They will know the congressman has told you to, to prove his point. So finally, you will tell them and I will be lost. I am sorry. Chelsky, put down that gun. I have no choice. No. Wait a minute. What if we could get him out of Poland? Impossible. He's an American citizen. If we could get him as far as the United States Embassy here, he'd be on foreign soil. They couldn't touch him. And he'd never have to name you. But what does he say? Well, Lubachev? I... I don't know. They'd send out the story that I betrayed my cousin Rovek. We'll stand behind you. We'll back up what you told us. Go with him, darling. It's the only chance you have. If, if Maria could come with me. I don't see how. She's a Polish national. We could never hold her. And our legal claim will be that you took sanctuary in the embassy as a political hostage. If you bring along a wife you've been openly living with for the past few years, the captivity plea blows up in our faces. 
I won't be separated from her. Pachowski, look out! He's got his gun. Young dog! He was going to kill me! Ah. Come on, Marina! Pachowski, I'm you... all right. Get back. He's getting away. No, he's not. <laughs> How is he? <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm very sorry. He's dead. Across his own grave. 1920, 1951. I don't think we should change the date. That's when it happened. This is Hildegard again. You know, I've been told many times that music is the universal language. Well, I'm sure that it does approach it, certainly. But I think there's a much more universal language, and that is prayer. From the infant lisping phrases newly learned and not quite understood, to the old person dying on a bed of pain, with life's meaning now clearer before dimming eyes, there's a symphony for you, far and above mere man to comprehend. In such a symphony there are no scratchy fiddles, no untuned strings or broken reeds. Just one vast harp, the harp of a thousand strings. Each voice of prayer is a voice in tune, for it is tuned to the infinite concertmaster who hears every pulsing string and throbbing note and every gentle rhythm and tender harmony. Now, every family of prayer is such a symphony, a mother, father, children, with voices raised to the Almighty in daily family prayer. Yes, this is indeed music to his ears. Family theater again reminds you, the family that prays together stays together. More things are wrought by prayer than this world dreams of. From Hollywood, Family Theater has brought you transcribed Hostage, starring John Lund. Hildegard was your hostess. Others in our cast were Herb Butterfield, Ben Wright, Lillian Bayef, Jack Crucian, Lou Krugman, and Eddie Firestone. The script was written and directed for Family Theater by John T. Kelly, with music composed and conducted by Henry Mancini. This series of Family Theater broadcasts is made possible by the thousands of you who feel the need for this type of program by the Mutual Network, which has responded to this need, and by the hundreds of stars of stage, screen, and radio who give so unselfishly of their time and talent to appear on our family theater stage. To them and to you, our humble thanks. This is Tony Lofrano expressing the wish of family theater that the blessing of God may be upon you and your home and inviting you to join us next week when family theater will present To the Losers Belong the Spoils. Eddie Fisher will be your host. Join us, won't you? Family Theater is broadcast throughout the world and originates in the Hollywood studios of the world's largest network. This is Mutual, the radio network for all America.